Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hello, and thank you for watching. For the past few weeks, Central Square has played host to public property as that we have a tragedy of the commons issue saying happy holidays. Voluntary interactions where individuals are free to act so long as they don't initiate force. This morning, we gathered our man for Sergeant Tom Ball. Good evening. Thank you for watching Free King TV. I'm your anchor, Allie Havens. Starting out in local news tonight, Price Chopper was robbed by an armed man in the early hours of Friday. Brandishing a black handgun and demanding cash, a man wearing a blue ski mask robbed the store and escaped on a motorcycle. Local police searched for the motorcycle and found it abandoned in Swansea. Evidence has led police to suspect William Lee Jr. of Winchester. This violent individual is still evading accountability. The Sears parking lot also had a violent incident this past Friday when a fight over a tool degenerated into a stabbing. Alvin Hilero of Westmoreland is being charged in the stabbing and is being held on a $15,000 cash bail. The victim was taken to the local hospital and was not identified. Police enter the home of a former state rep to confiscate recording devices and tapes. This isn't a movie. This is Deerfield, New Hampshire, and the victim is Harriet Caddy. ReadlyReport.com broke this story and published an email received from Harriet. In the email, she describes the encounter where police had a search warrant. They reportedly confiscated two audio recording devices and four tapes. Harriet Caddy was recently thrown out of the city council meeting. She then went to the town office to get a copy of the meeting's record. When the city administrator refused, Harriet pulled out an audio recorder to capture their refusal. This attempt at recording public officials in the course of their duties was enough to work up wiretapping charges and a search warrant. This is just the beginning of the story. We will be investigating further into the situation. We turn our attention now to a subject that affects us all, economics. This video is from the John Burt Society and does a good job of, of explaining the idea of capital and the various types of capitalism. Take a look. Just as there is widespread confusion regarding political systems, there is similar confusion in the economic arena. All during the 20th century, Americans were led to believe that there was a great struggle going on between capitalism and the communist world. Undoubtedly, a struggle existed, but the real adversaries were rarely identified properly. No discussion about economic systems will make sense without first defining terms. And one of the most basic terms in economics is capital, whose definition is the means of production. To illustrate what capital is, let's consider a very simple economy. On the sands of a small island, a castaway has just washed ashore. He has no food and he's hungry. He searches the island, he finds no berries, coconuts, or anything edible. He goes back into the water and tries to catch fish with his bare hands, but he fails. So he goes back up on shore, he finds a bush. He breaks off a branch, he gnaws at one end to make a sharp tip. Back into the water he goes, and with his spear, he catches fish. His spear is capital. It's the means of production for catching fish. He gave up some of his time and some of his energy to produce something he could not eat, but something that would help him to produce something that he could eat. Capital, therefore, can be tools, machinery, and even a man's handmade spear to catch fish. Such being the case, consider that the communists in the former Soviet Union, as well as in China and Cuba, have always used tools and machinery. Officials there even view people as capital. Therefore, by strict definition, are not communists capitalists? For that matter, isn't everyone a capitalist? And so, is not every economic system a capitalist system? What then is the difference between what the communist system is and what the American capitalist system is supposed to be? The difference is ownership of the capital. Is the system monopolistic, state-controlled capitalism? Or is it competitive, free enterprise capitalism? It is between these two opposing economic systems that a battle has always raged. The term private property also needs clarification, for private ownership and control of property is a key component in the free enterprise system. 
In order for ownership of property to be full and complete, all four of its aspects must be met. These are title, control, use, and the ability to dispose of what a person owns. In a free market economy, these aspects are unrestrained, so long as the owner does not infringe on the legitimate rights and claims of others. True ownership of property and freedom go hand in hand. They always have. Now let's compare the two systems of capitalism. In the competitive free enterprise system, capital or property is both owned privately and controlled privately. In the monopolistic system, holding title to capital can be accomplished privately or by the state. But more importantly, capital is controlled by the state or by the elite few who control the state. The Communist Manifesto, which contains the basic program for all communists and all socialists, explicitly preaches the destruction and abolition of private property. Karl Marx understood the powers of controlling capital and so have all communists and socialists who have ever looked and still look to Marx as their leader. State-controlled capitalism results in high prices and low quality. After all, why would a monopoly strive to improve if it has no competition? On the other hand, honest, thrifty and hard-working producers throughout the world prefer a competitive free enterprise system for all. Here, low prices and high quality prevail because a variety of producers will seek to attract the widest amount of customers. Competition results in excellence and always has. Just as the political spectrum shows the range of government power, we can also plot the various economic systems along another spectrum. These forms of government control in the market stand in sharp contrast with a completely free market. In the last century or so, there have been basically four forms of state-controlled economies, all on the far left of the economic spectrum. Fascism, Nazism, Socialism, and Communism. In each, the government controls the capital. The difference among these is how much is owned or controlled outright by the government. In a fascist system, the government doesn't own businesses on paper, but it does control them. In Mussolini's Italy, even though he didn't hold title to businesses, he told the owners what to produce, how much to produce, when to produce, where to buy raw materials, who to hire, who to fire, and what price to charge. The rest, he said, was up to them. The fascist system is more efficient than other state control systems insofar as those living under it think they still own their businesses. Shopkeepers concern themselves with maintenance on the machinery, employee relations, painting the building, and so forth. But the government controls owners through an array of taxation and regulations. Under Nazism, which means National Socialism, its proponents went one step further and acquired ownership of some corporations, such as Volkswagen. However, Hitler didn't seize ownership of other industrial giants. He simply controlled them just as Mussolini had controlled businesses in Italy. Socialism is where government officials acquire possession of major industries such as transportation, communications, and utilities in order to leverage control over the entire economy. Through ownership of these vital segments of industry and by creating government regulatory agencies, socialists gain control over virtually everything else. Finally, there is communism, the granddaddy of all in the economic sense, in a way, communism is more honest than fascism because all of the capital is owned and controlled by the state. There are no pretenses about it. I just wanted to make a comment about that video. While it did a great job explaining the differences of types of economies which uh, government operate over, I would like to state that different views about how economies should be run are okay as long as they're all voluntary. For instance, voluntarists believe that you should be able to have a commune or some kind of socialistic economy as long as all the participants are doing it voluntarily. For instance, families sort of operate under a socialistic paradigm, but it's voluntary, so that's okay. Uh, next, we take a look at a video that explains the cronyism apparent in the current paradigm.
Increasing protests around the country are a testament to the frustration many Americans share with the lagging economy. Protesters are rightly angry that big corporations and big government are working together to benefit at the expense of everyone else. In the case of the Occupy Wall Street people, they're blaming capitalism for a consequence that is, in my view, unquestionably a result of what can at best be called crony capitalism. Well, there, there's so much frustration in this, in this economy, and so they're looking for somebody to blame. I think there's, there's tr tremendously good reasons for this resentment, but it's misdirected towards anger at the bankers and anger at the industrialists. But in reality, the recession had many more causes uh, beyond Wall Street and beyond the bankers. Crony capitalism means that your success as an entrepreneur depends less on how well you meet your customers' needs and more on how well you curry favor from the government. And it's a problem because it means that valuable resources, including the best and brightest minds, are diverted from productive uses towards unproductive, seeking government favors. Politics it is a, a struggle to get a larger share of the spoils. And when you've got the federal government spending close to $4 trillion a year, uh, people want a piece of those goodies. They want some of that. You have billions of dollars at stake here. People are making billions of dollars illicitly by using the government. They're, gonna, they're not going to stop doing that just because you write a statute. It's highly unlikely that increasing regulation will lead to less money in government, less business money devoted to government. In fact, it's likely to have the opposite effect. That's what we've seen over the last few decades. As we've seen an increase in regulatory activity, we've seen an increase in, in companies having to have a Washington office. There was no substantial deregulation. The idea that we were living in some laissez-faire world in 2008 is absurd. Any measure that you look at, um, number of regulators, number of regulatory agencies, number of pages in the Federal Register and the Code of Federal Regulations have all been increasing. The conventional wisdom is that big, big businesses oppose regulation and consumer groups and environmental groups support regulation to protect the public interest. But I think you'll find that that's a myth. Government, either overtly or more often covertly, uses its influence, uses its ability to tax and regulate, not with the intention of helping the general public, but with the intention of padding the bottom lines of the favored firms and industries. It's the government mingling into the capitalist system and trying to decide who to save and, and who, to, who to let fall. You show me a politician on Capitol Hill, even ones that I agree with, I will show you a self-interested person. Rent-seeking is seeking those excess profits that the government can confer through regulation. And so if when businesses know that there's a regulation or they can even seek out, encourage the government to issue a regulation, it is in their interest to support lawmakers to get the regulation to, to turn out in a way that they gain the rents at the expense of others. That's not capitalism. That's that's, that, that's an end round around capitalism. And I think they've got to look to Washington rather than Wall Street. I mean, it's easy for the politicians, and particularly in a presidential election year, to push the blame off on somebody else. You always have to have somebody else to blame. The only real way a corporate plutocrat can force you to do anything against your will is if that corporate plutocrat has the force of government behind him or her. More regulation will lead to more rent-seeking and more crony capitalism. Without special protections that can only be provided by an increasingly powerful government, big businesses would have to compete to earn their profits instead of taking them straight from taxpayers. We all agree, businesses should succeed or fail based on the value they provide to their consumers, not based on their ability to influence the political system. And that's what happens in a free market. We have one last video to show you. In this video by Graham Wright, an alien visitor, is explained the concept of government. Take a look. Hey, an alien. Yes, I've traveled across space to check on the progress of your species. Cool. Shall I take you to our leader? Your what? 
our leader, the guy in charge. The guy in charge of what? Well, in charge of everything. You have one guy in charge of everything? No, no, he's in charge of government. What is government? Well, government makes the rules for us. It tells us what we can do and what we can't do. So is government really smart? They come up with wise rules for you to follow? Well, mostly. But some of its rules are really stupid. Do you disregard those rules? No, we have to follow the rules, even if they are stupid or we disagree with them. Government punishes anyone who disobeys the rules. So you are slaves to government? No, 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 it's not like that at all. Government works for us, the people. It serves us. We're the boss. It tells you what to do, and it punishes you with violence if you disobey it, and yet you're its boss? Yeah. But there are some things government does that you don't like. Well, yeah, not everything government does is popular, like spending on wars, for example. What is a war? It's when government basically spends the people's money on weapons and soldiers and then sends them over to the other side of the world to kill a bunch of people over there and destroy their country. I don't like it that government does this. Well, I can see why you might not like that. Have you humans reached the stage where you generally consider stealing, enslaving and killing each other to be bad things? Oh yeah, we know that. Don't steal, don't attack, don't assault. But you give money to government and they use it to kill people. Well, yeah. But government does good things with tax money as well. Why don't you stop paying for the things you don't like and only pay for the good things it does? No, we can't do that. You can't just decide to stop paying taxes because... The rules say that everyone has to pay taxes. But the rules come from government, though, don't they? Yeah. So government made a rule which says that everyone has to pay them money. So everyone pays taxes because if they didn't, government would punish them using violence? Well, yes, but most people don't mind paying taxes. Most people feel obligated to pay taxes and obey government laws because it's for the good of society. Society needs government, and that means we all have to pay taxes. So just to make sure I've got this straight, government makes the rules and you feel obligated to follow the rules, even the ones you don't like, and it tells you what to do and threatens to punish you if you don't do what it says and it uses some of the money that it's taken from you using threats of violence to pay for things you don't like and actually think are immoral, like mass murder. Yeah, but we can ask it to please tell us to do smart things and please don't take our money and use it to kill people. We're allowed to ask them to tell us to do what we want them to tell us to do. Are you guys just scared of this thing? Is government some huge monster that can just squish you at any moment if you disobey? No, government isn't a monster. Well, what is it then? Could you draw me a picture of it? Government isn't really the sort of thing you can draw a picture of. Maybe you could take me to it. Where is government? You mean the building? Government is a building. No, but the politicians who make up the government have buildings they work from. So government is a group of these politicians? Yeah. OK, so what species are these politicians? Well, they're... human. Like you? Yeah. So politicians are humans, and they're government. You're a human, but you're not government. No. 
So it's the politicians. They're the ones that boss the rest of you around and make you do things you don't want to do and take your money using threats of violence. But even though you're all humans, you're not allowed to boss them around and take their money? No, they'd put us in a cage if we did that. But look, it's not like the politicians can just do whatever they want. Like, a politician can't just come up to me on the street and make me give him money. They can't do that. Politicians can only do things like that in their job, when they're working for government. Oh, so politicians aren't government. They just work for government. Yeah. OK, so government isn't a monster, and it isn't a building, and it's not politicians, it's something else. And it employs politicians, who are just regular humans, who get to order everyone else around and take their money. How does a regular human become a politician? Well, that's the great thing about our government. It's a democracy. And that means that the people actually have the power. Because we get to decide who among us get to be the politicians. We get to vote. And if a politician starts doing things we don't like, we can just replace him with someone else at the next election. So the people that get chosen to be politicians only get to boss people around and take their money for a short time. And then they go back to being regular humans? Exactly. That sounds like a powerful position to be in. But if you get to choose who does that, I assume that politicians are always the wisest, most honest, caring and respected people among you. Well, no, not really. I wouldn't say politicians are known for being honest, or wise, or caring. And they're certainly not the most respected people among us. Come to think of it, most politicians are lying, power-hungry crooks. The ones you chose? Yeah, they're always doing things we don't like. They use taxpayers' money to enrich themselves and their friends, and they never keep their promises to voters. They've been caught stealing and lying and taking bribes, and they mostly do what the big corporations want. Yeah, they're always doing stuff like that. They're completely corrupt. They're a bunch of lying crooks. But you said that most humans know that stealing and beating each other up and killing are wrong. And you said that you have the power because you can change who's in charge. So why don't you just replace the lying, thieving, murderous, crooked politicians with some regular people? Well, we don't try to elect lying crooks. It just always turns out that way. But we have to have a government because some humans are nasty and might kill or enslave or steal. Civilization just couldn't survive without government. Let me get this straight. Because you're worried about the small number of nasty people that are willing to kill, enslave and steal, you think it's necessary for your survival to have a system where some humans among you, for a short while, get to call themselves the government, and they get to order everyone else around like slaves, and, if they want, commit mass murder overseas, using money they stole using threats of violence. Politicians get to kill, enslave and steal, because if they didn't, someone else might? And you try to elect good, honest people to be politicians, but what happens every time is that the people you elect turn out to be corrupt, evil, lying crooks. That's your system. Yeah, that's pretty much government. That was the objective extraterrestrial questioning. Just some guy <laughs> explaining government. Um, so our next video, it's from the YouTube channel Learn Liberty, and they explain how um, capitalism, or private property rights actually, are uh, good for the little guy. Take a look. Some people think that institutions like property rights only protect wealthy landowners and that somehow thinking that it's important to take property rights seriously is something that only rich people would be interested in. But The reality is uh, stable property rights are the little guy's best protection against being taken advantage of by those fat cats.
if you want the little developer, the little businessman, um, the private citizen, to be able to stand on an equal footing with large corporations and big interests that have money, uh, the best way to make sure that happens is to be sure that their property rights are as equally protected as that of the heavy hitters. Property rights are the little guy's best protection not only against abuse by the government but also by being taken advantage of by larger corporations and interests. For example, consider some of the recent controversies involving what's called eminent domain where the government takes your land. The Constitution does give the government the power to take certain lands that are privately held for public use. But interestingly, if we understand public use in terms of giving them to another private citizen because they think they can develop that land more efficiently, then you're really not taking the land for public use, but for another person's private use. The best way to protect a small landowner from being taken advantage of by a wealthy landowner is to make sure that the small landowner's property rights are strongly protected against that kind of seizure. Another example is what we call civil asset forfeiture. Let's say that you're driving in your car and you're suspected of having had drugs in the car. They can seize your car. Now, it doesn't matter if you're ultimately found not to have been in possession of any illegal substances. Once they've seized your car, they get to keep your car. Because the idea is that the car doesn't have rights, only you do. But this seems like a violation of your rights because you've just lost your car. So the idea of having robust property rights is what's going to keep your car in your own possession. So robust protection of property rights is the little guy's best insulation against both state abuse and being taken advantage of by larger, wealthier interests. Really, the unifying factor of all these videos is just that everyone should have equal rules applied to everyone, that people in government shouldn't have special rules regarding their behavior, and nor should big businesses or private interests or minorities. Everyone should have the same rules applied to them. And what's important is to find rules that can be applied to everyone in the most fair way possible. So, you know, there are just certain universal rules like not aggressing upon others in the form of fraud or physical violence and private property, respecting other people's private property. The last video we just watched talked about asset forfeiture and eminent domain as just examples of people's, of the little guy's private property being abused. But then also, you know, you've got environmental problems where some companies are using, uh, polluting other people's property and getting away with it because of the laws. So that's just another example of private property not being respected. Uh, thanks for watching Freekeen TV. If you have any questions, send them or comments, send them to tv at freekeen.com. I'm Allie Havens.